Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second edition of our virtual programming. Today we are here with COVID-19 Ask the Experts, or as I like to call it, COVID-19 You Ask and We Answer. My name is Kelly McCoy. I'm the Events and Outreach Manager at the Foundation. And today I am joined by a very special guest, Dr. Ken Gorson, who is the Chairman of our Global Medical Advisory Board. Hi, Ken. Thanks for joining us today. Happy to be here, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. It's so appreciated. So we have taken these questions from you, our members. So from our socials and the inquiries at the office, we've done our best to compile them down um, and we will do our best to answer them all today. If you do not have your particular question answered at the end, I will show you a link to our website where we will have more information. All right, so let's get started. So this is our most popular question by far. Does having GBS, CIDP, or MMN mean that I have a weakened immune system? And am I at more risk of contracting COVID-19? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, I would suggest that for patients with remote Guillain-Barre, for whom they fully recovered from their illness, they probably don't have any immune issues, assuming that they don't have any other complicated health problems. Uh, in contrast, in patients who have CIDP or multifocal motor neuropathy, it is a chronic autoimmune condition, and so I think it's probably conservative to classify them as having comorbid conditions. So they have to be particularly careful. Uh, furthermore, it's less the issue of having the diagnosis of CIDP or MMN, and more the issue of being on uh, active immunosuppressant therapy. Uh, IVIG is not an immunosuppressant, it's an immunomodulating therapy. It's pooled intravenous antibody from healthy uh, blood donors. Uh, so that may be less of an issue in terms of immune compromise with treatment, uh, but folks who are on chronic corticosteroids, prednisone or oral pulse dexamethasone or IV methylprednisolone, or some of the secondary immune treatments that we use such as intravenous rituximab or mycophenolate or azathioprine or cyclosporin or methotrexate. These are all secondary immune drugs that are used to stabilize patients with CIDP and MNN and even um, chemotherapy in rare cases such as cyclophosphamide. Those folks most definitely have a compromised immune system and should be particularly wary about a COVID exposure. Great, so the, the short answer is inherently no, but in some cases, yes. Depending on their immune therapies. Great, thank you. Okay, if I develop COVID-19, can I suffer a relapse or a reoccurrence of my condition? Alternatively, how do I know if I am experiencing a relapse or a reoccurrence? So uh, in theory, the answer is yes. I mean, COVID-19 is like any other virus that are circulating in the environment. So just as patients who may contract influenza or, or any other cold or upper respiratory illness or gastrointestinal illness, uh, those infections can serve as triggers to a relapse. Uh, often that would be considered a pseudo relapse in the sense that it's not sort of occurring spontaneously or around uh, withdrawal of immune treatment, such that typically patients can improve spontaneously once the infection is cleared. Uh, we don't really have a clear understanding because it really hasn't been studied well. We're so early into this that we just don't know uh, you know, what the relapse issue is going to be around COVID-19, but I think in theory, uh, it's certainly plausible. Um, uh, regarding uh, experiencing a relapse or reoccurrence, it's just like in the absence of COVID-19, uh, patients should have recurrence of the symptoms that they first had in terms of progressive weakness or balance difficulties or increasing numbness or tingling, uh, uh, in, uh, discoordination, impairment in fine motor skills, the sorts of symptoms that they had and initially that led them to the diagnosis of CIDP or MMN in the first place uh, should be a clue. If those symptoms start to worsen again, they should contact their treating neurologist. Great. And in terms of a Guillain-Barre relapse, that's incredibly rare, right? 
That is correct. That's extraordinarily rare. It can happen probably well below 5% of patients can have a remote relapse, what's called recurrent Guillain-Barre syndrome. There's probably something unique about those patients who have a, a recurrent episode of Guillain-Barre, uh, you know, months or many years, even decades later. So that is not the norm. For the overwhelming majority of patients, for Guillain-Barre, it is a monophasic illness. It's a one-time disease. Great, thank you. Okay, this is a hot topic and a controversial one. We'll, we'll do this in two parts. So firstly, does having GBS or CIDP mean I should never get any vaccinations? Yeah, so the answer is definitely no to that question. The one situation that we keep in mind is in patients who have had influenza vaccine associated Guillain-Barre. And what I mean by that is if you got a flu vaccine and developed Guillain-Barre syndrome within six weeks of that vaccination, the recommendation is that you don't receive the flu vaccine moving forward. For everybody else, there is no contraindication to getting influenza vaccinations and for that matter, any other vaccine if it's indicated. So in fact, the argument could be made that in healthy individuals, if you get a flu vaccine, you should reduce your risk of flu infection. And we know flu is a preceding virus that triggers Guillain-Barre. So in the general population, it is recommended that everybody get a flu vaccination unless there is a specific contraindication. With all other vaccines, there's very limited data, but the argument would be, if you haven't had a tetanus shot within 10 years, it's really recommended, or if you step on a nail, you should probably get a tetanus vaccine in that situation to avoid the risk of getting tetanus. And the same is true for preventative vaccinations in individuals who travel and need vaccinations uh, to prevent contracting illnesses abroad, and particularly in unusual places. And uh, there's no reason not to get those vaccinations. So a question that um, you likely can't really answer, uh, should I consider a COVID-19 vaccine when it is available? Yeah, so uh, given uh, the current chaos that we're living in now, it's uh, recognized that a vaccine is the ultimate approach to managing uh, COVID-19 and reducing the risk of infection and serious illness uh, moving forward. We're not going to have a COVID vaccine available for at least a year to 18 months, perhaps even longer. So the caveat is, is before the COVID-19 vaccine is developed and available for the general population, it will be uh, put through rigorous testing to make sure that one, it works, and two, there are no associated complications or significant safety concerns with the vaccine. So I think this is something that we can worry about in the future, but theoretically, uh, everybody who has an opportunity to get the COVID-19 uh, vaccine when it becomes eventually available should strongly consider it. Okay. Should I skip my IVIG therapy to mitigate my exposure to COVID-19? And alternatively, what are best practices to protect myself during my infusion? Yeah, so the general recommendation, not just for neurological diseases, but all diseases in general, is that you should not skip your treatments, certainly without discussing it with your uh, uh, treating primary care or neurologist. Uh, there is no reason to skip IVIG. Uh, there, it will not, in theory, put you at any further risk for contracting the coronavirus, but there's a strong likelihood if you are dependent on IVIG to keep your disease in long-term remission, you will be at very high risk for relapse of the illness with further disability and further comorbidity, which in theory could put you at greater risk of complications if you ever contract COVID-19. Uh, regarding best practices, uh, this is a fairly standard uh, recommendation for everybody in the population, uh, but in particular, patients will be um, interacting uh, with infusion nurses, they may be traveling to infusion centers and so forth. So the general recommendation in, in dealing with your infusion is that you should wash your hands as frequently as possible around the infusions before and after. Uh, you should wear a mask. You shouldn't touch your face. 
If you want to wear gloves, that's perfectly reasonable. And you want to make sure that you are treating providers, uh, particularly infusion nurses, have the proper uh, PPE equipment to reduce their risk of transmitting the virus to you. Great, and we are recommending uh, for patients to reconsider home infusion therapy if you're currently going to infusion suites or hospitals. Chelsea discussed this in the first edition of our virtual programming, but there are there is some new legislation in place where you may now qualify if you didn't qualify previously. So something to consider. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a great point. There is some theoretical risk in uh, traveling if your uh, infusion facility is located in a major medical center where you are perhaps coming in contact in hallways or closer quarters uh, with patients in general before you get to the infusion clinic. If you're in an infusion clinic, it's really important to social distance. I'm sure they have this under control already for at least six feet apart uh, between infusion patients. So I think these protocols are well established and, and in place such that uh, patients really don't need to worry about the provider side of this. They just need to be careful about what they do in terms of reducing their exposure risk. All right, very good point. What steps can I take to strengthen my immune system? Yeah, so there, there's no magic pill out there that will strengthen your immune system. A lot of this is sort of conventional wisdom based upon a lot of prior data in the general population that uh, patients should do uh, you know, a, a variety of things that, that's within their control. So regular exercise, to the extent patients can do regular exercise, allowing for their level of impairment and disability, has been clearly shown to boost your immune system. So some form of regular daily exercise, whether it's walking, cycling, whatever it is that the patients can do would be good. Uh, adequate restorative sleep is really important. Sleep deprivation has been shown to have uh, deleterious effects on the immune system. So whatever sort of amount and quality of sleep you need, you wanna make sure you get that. You wanna have a good nutritious diet. You know, something like the Mediterranean diet, high in fruits and vegetables, would probably be a healthy approach in terms of managing your nutritional status and uh, maintaining adequate hydration because dehydration can certainly uh, aggravate symptoms in some individuals. And that, of course, allows for the fact that patients don't have a contraindication to fluid intake, like congestive heart failure or kidney issues or liver issues or things like that. Uh, social connectivity is important, uh, allowing for our difficulties now to the extent patients can interact with family members and friends through phone or Zoom or FaceTime would be really good. You know, sort of maintaining good mental health will also help maintain uh, good physical health uh, and not smoking is also really important. There's some data that suggests if you're vitamin D deficient, vitamin D supplements would be appropriate to normalize your vitamin D level. Uh, those are some of the general recommendations to maintain a good healthy immune system. Great, so none of our bad quarantine habits are allowed other than the sleeping part. I think I have that down pat. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so uh, as we know right now, there is a very high need for blood and plasma products. So a question that we've received is, can I donate blood or plasma if I have had GBS or have CIDP? Absolutely. There, there is no contraindication to donating blood for either of these conditions. And so uh, it would be a very altruistic thing and I would encourage our patient population to consider doing this. Great. Okay, this is a timely question. Why is COVID not causing GBS like Zika or other flu-like conditions? Yeah, so um, this is, um, uh, we don't know that it's not actually. So uh, there have been now six reported cases in the literature, uh, one from China and five cases of GBS from Northern Italy that have been linked to infection with COVID. We, we have to be really cautious about interpreting this information because of course Guillain-Barre occurs in the general population even without any preceding infections. So there's a baseline background uh, prevalence of Guillain-Barre syndrome. We don't know that these are not just coincidental relationships. Uh, this will be further clarified as more, there, as more reports come out. Uh, the, the study from 
uh, northern Italy suggested five cases out of about 1,000 to 1,200 COVID-infected patients in their cohort. And that would suggest a much higher background prevalence of Guillaume barre But again, there's no case controls here to compare. So it could be that COVID-19 is, uh, is or, or the coronavirus SARS-2 is just another virus like the other viruses that we recognize as triggers for GBS. We don't know that it has a greater risk of developing a GBS like Zika does, where Zika is clearly a neurotropic virus, and there was a huge increase in the um, in the risk of GBS in Zika infected patients. So the signal was really large, really early. We're not seeing that right now, but we are so early into this. And I'm fairly certain there are going to be more reports of GBS and, and COVID-19. The issue is before we can draw any conclusions, we really need good case control studies. We have a, an enormous cohort of COVID patients who have GBS and then a, a cohort uh, of COVID negative cases, and we compare them and see what the uh, prevalence or incidence of GBS would be in these two populations to demonstrate that in fact there is an excess number of cases in COVID-19 infected patients. So the story is not yet out on this. Okay. Good to know. We've, um, we've seen a lot of swirling of those news articles, so I'm, I'm thankful for you for uh, breaking that down for us. Okay. I've heard that plasma is being used to treat COVID-19 patients. Should I worry about a plasma shortage for IVAG, and what is convalescent plasma? Yeah, um, so let's take uh, convalescent plasma first, so that because it dovetails into the next, the first question. Uh, with convalescent plasma, what happens is a patient has an infection, viral or bacterial, and their immune system is triggered to neutralize or kill the virus or bacteria. And the way that is done was with generating antibodies that are directed against the, um, the offending infection. So these antibodies are then circulating thereafter. And so in the patient who recovers from the viral bacterial infection, if you draw their plasma after they recover, they will have these circulating bodies or circulating antibodies directed against the infection. That's what convalescent plasma is. So in the current situation, What's going on is that in patients who've had COVID-19 infection and recovered, they will have circulating antibodies against COVID-19. And the idea uh, theoretically is that if you use their plasma, they donate their plasma, and then you can infuse that into uh, seriously ill patients with COVID-19, you may be able to hasten uh, those patients' recovery. Uh, I have no concerns about a shortage of plasma related to this particular technique because really it's very small in terms of the numbers going on now. Uh, the plasma that's being donated are from specific individuals who've had COVID-19 infection not used from the general population. And really this is all done in the setting of experimental trials and protocols at uh, in major academic medical centers where they're using the convalescent plasma from recovered COVID-19 patients in a controlled situation. So the numbers are really small and I would encourage folks not to worry about this particular issue right now. Great, so two different pools. There's the source plasma that goes into IVIG and then there's this plasma that's being used to treat patients. So no need to worry. Correct. Great. Okay, well that's it, Ken. Thank you so very much for taking the time. I know our members are going to greatly appreciate this. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Uh, we have a very robust and dynamic website right now just dedicated to COVID housed on our website. If you just go to our website, gbs-cidp.org, you can scroll down a little bit to our newsroom where you'll see all of the COVID-19 tagged articles. We're keeping that updated right now. There's about four pages worth and you'll be able to revisit this video later. So thank you all and thank you, Ken. My pleasure, glad to be helpful. Thank you.